I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. When it comes to the relationship between the city and the province, there's a lot at play. There's funding agreements, there's infrastructure, there's housing and homelessness, not to mention mask mandates. Today, in a special sit-down with Edmonton Mayor Amarjeet Sohi, we address some of these issues and more. My guest today is Edmonton Mayor Amarjeet Sohi. Mr. Mayor, thanks very much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me uh, once again, Dave. Happy to join you. No back. worries. Yeah. Um, now, it's been a busy week at the intersection of provincial politics and municipal politics. I wanted to get, kind of get your thoughts on some of what's been going on mm -hmm. this week. And I think the first thing I wanted to touch on is um, Premier Kenny appeared at the Alberta Municipalities, uh, I guess, kind of big meeting or, or forum I, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and he was talking about... Um, First, he was talking about funding for EMS, but one of the big messages that was coming out of his speech was the idea that, you know, despite the fact Alberta seems to be awash in money right now, we seem to be doing a little better fiscally speaking because of the rise in oil prices, that municipalities should be a little cautious before they come to the province hat in hand asking for, for more money mm -hmm. uh, for projects. And I'm just curious, you know... I know that before the budget, you had a wish list of things that you wanted to see in the budget. And I know that you didn't necessarily get all that you were hoping for out of the provincial budget. And we can talk about that in a bit. But I, I guess, you know, what was your take on Mr. Kenny's speech to Alberta municipalities leaders? You know, first of all, uh, I think we should always be uh, uh, prudent with uh, the resources that we have. So uh, and we need to use them as effectively as possible to uh, achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve for our, our communities, which, which is building the capacity of people to be successful. I think uh, we need to recognize that there are a number of needs in, a, in communities. I don't like using the word wish list, right? Well, mm -hmm. It's not really a wish. It is what we need out there. For example, the crisis that we're facing in houselessness. It is not a wish list. It's a real need where people are being hurt. Uh, our economy is being held back. People don't feel safe downtown. And we had we are seeing disorder that is impacting our businesses. And another is opiate crisis. Opiate crisis is not a wish list. It is a real need out there. We see two Edmontonians die every day in Edmonton streets because of the poisoning that they are, they are taking because of the addictions and the mental health challenges they're facing, right? So I think we need to uh, think about when we budget that we should be budgeting on the priorities of communities and allocating resources based on that. And that is where I differ with the Premier, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, saving for the future, absolutely important. But saving at whose cost, right? I think that cost is real today and that cost is uh, human suffering that cost is holding our economy back that cost is not investing today to build people's capacity the human capital that is so necessary for the future economic and social growth of our, of our city right so i think that's the approach uh, we would like to take with them when we uh, when we engage with province I, I do get what you're saying when it, when it comes to the idea that we're, we're talking about needs that need to be addressed. Um, I mean, at the same time, the province has, has stated, you know, we're going to have a, con a relatively um, conservative estimate for, for oil prices this year because we can't necessarily, you know, budget at $90 a barrel because we don't know if it's going to stay as high as it is right now or higher than that. Um, do you feel like you're getting all that you need from the province based on where the projections are at right now? Do you feel that perhaps maybe the government posting a $500 million surplus was maybe a little too high? Or do you, or do you think that that goal is prudent? And, and within that, the premier is kind of working within those, those fiscal constraints that he has in place. And maybe at the end of the year, if the surplus is a little bigger, there may be more money to go around. Yeah. So I was disappointed uh, in the budget, I made my disappointment uh, pretty known uh, mm -hmm. uh, because we asked for bare minimum um, uh, for uh, asks and uh, only one was uh, grant uh, supported and that was very 
phenomenal amount of money. Uh, but I think we also need to understand, Dave, that for the long-term financial sustainability of our province and our cities, which Premier was talking about, and I agree with them on that, requires us to look at what are the cost drivers right, today. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest cost drivers for healthcare, for uh, justice system, for police services, is the housing crisis, is the opiate crisis. It is cheaper to house people and provide them wrapped around services today than is actually to manage the houselessness. Right? So it's almost double. You can eliminate your immediate cost pressures by investing in supportive housing, by investing in wrapped around services today and save money for the long run. So I think if you're looking at the overall financial sustainability, poverty also costs cost a lot of money to manage, right? Because people, uh, when they're not properly, their human capital is not developed, they live in poverty and uh, and they draw so many resources from, uh, from services. But if you can invest in people's capacity to uh, look after themselves, then um, you save money in the long run. So I think it's not just uh, financial savings that you need to tuck away into a, into a heritage fund that will give you financial sustainability. Yes, that is important. But the true financial sustainability of your community will come when people rely less on social programs, when they rely less on uh, on healthcare, when they rely less on uh, uh, on on policing. Right. So I think that is where we need to uh, we need to think. We need to shift our thinking in investing in people so they become independent, they become productive, and uh, they become less reliant on social networks. Yeah, and I know that you know. Obviously, you've made public statements since the budget um, about you know what items that you were hoping to see in the budget that weren't there, um, and even at Thursday after the premier speech at Alberta municipalities. Um, you, you suggested that, you know, while some funding for healthcare is good, there are housing issues, as you've mentioned here in this conversation, have you had a chance to talk to the premier since the budget was announced and, and address these concerns? And, and if so, you know, what was, what was the premier's response and, and how does that relationship work going forward? Um, if, if you appear to be at some distance apart on some of these key issues? Yeah. So we have a amicable. I have an amicable relationship with the premier. When we see each other, we, uh, you know, we always uh, show mutual respect for each other. So I saw him on Thursday. Didn't have the chance to talk about uh, uh, our Edmonton needs because he was there to give a speech and he was getting ready mm-hmm. to give that speech. But we sat aside with each other and we had a brief chat and we agreed to connect back. And uh, so I'll be reaching uh, uh, reaching out to his office to uh, set up a meeting as quickly as possible. But we are in, in discussions with other ministers, uh, uh, Minister Sani, uh, Rajan Sani, who is the transportation minister. We are having conversations with her about uh, tapping into the federal support for uh, funding the transit operational shortfall for Edmonton and Calgary. So those discussions are going really well. She is really championing that we don't leave any federal money on the table because uh, we want to take bring back every dollar <laughs> from Ottawa into uh, into our communities and uh, you know in touch with uh, uh, Minister McIver and uh, Mr. Swiser has been pretty uh, pretty uh, you know open to, uh, uh, to working with it and other ministers as well right so uh, our our conversations will continue because we need to work together that's how I look at it we may. Uh, disagree from time to time on issues, on on approaches, and how fast the support is being uh, being provided or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Edmontonians expect me to continue to strengthen my relationship with the provincial government and the federal government as well, right? And uh, and try to advocate on their behalf. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And all the issues that I talked about, the housing is not a municipal responsibility. Uh, yeah. Ending houselessness and ending opiate crisis and mental health crisis are not municipal responsibilities. These are provincial responsibilities. So we need to remind the province that uh, if you're investing in healthcare, absolutely we like that. We appreciate that. But also invest in areas that you have not invested in yet or haven't done enough of that are actually hurting our people 
and hurting our economic growth and hurting the revitalization and coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other items that I, I know that you were hoping to see in the provincial budget that wasn't addressed, and it, it may not seem as important as, as addressing homelessness and, and the addictions issues, but there was the, the notion that Edmonton could potentially play host to uh, games in the 2026 FIFA World Cup. I know that, you know, we need to kind of get to a, a certain point before uh, decisions are made around what Canadian cities are, are host cities to some of these games. This would be a huge uh, benefit to Edmonton's economy, would bring a whole lot of people into town. Do you, do you have any concerns that, that Edmonton could fall off the radar as far as being a host city uh, without that provincial commitment? Um, and has there been any movement on that since the budget? So our conversations are going, right? We are engaged with province, uh, our administration, and uh, other external agen agencies uh, like uh, uh, Explore Edmonton uh, are engaging with the uh, with the province on this. We're hopeful because we have a very strong economic case. Uh, hosting FIFA will generate close to uh, uh, $900 million of economic activity in the Edmonton region, not just Edmonton alone, in, in the in Edmonton region. But it will also provide us the opportunity to, uh, it's a global platform that you will have to mm -hmm. showcase your city, to showcase your province, and we can do so many things leading up to FIFA 2026 if we get the, uh, get to host the games. Uh, you know, bringing in people, talk about our hydrogen potential, for example. Bring in people to talk about our artificial intelligence uh, uh, potential. Talking about uh, the work we're doing in energy transition uh, and the and the work uh, we can potentially do in lithium to electrify the world because that's exactly what is needed. And the and the potential in geothermal and really really portray our province as a forward thinking. A forward looking province that is taking on so much uh, good work that we are doing in this province. We are leading in, in, in innovation in many, many areas. I think that global platform provides us the opportunity to tell the world what is happening in Edmonton region, what is happening in Alberta, and why people should be coming to live here, to invest here, build their lives here and start their business here. I think it's a huge opportunity for us. Uh, not only we don't have to wait till 2026, we can start using this global platform to highlight what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanted to move on to probably what a lot of people were really focused on in Edmonton this week. And this was the the notion of the, the will they or won't they eliminate the city's masking bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, the province announced that as of March 1st, its uh, provincial masking mandate was mostly lifted except for high risk locations. And Calgary followed suit pretty quickly saying that they were going to get rid of their masking bylaw. And here in Edmonton, we had to wait a few days. We had to wait for a special council meeting. And there was a lot of debate, you know, a lot of, a lot of speculation over whether uh, people would keep the council would vote to keep the mask bylaw or, or get rid of it. And thrown into the mix was the idea that uh, Premier Kenny had floated that, well, if cities won't do away with these rules, we may have to bring in uh, a legislative hammer and, and do it ourselves. And and so just as council was set to debate the getting rid of the mask bylaw or keeping it, um, Minister McIver introduced Bill 4, which... I was kind of surprised at how narrow it was, but it basically said that municipalities can't bring in their own masking rules to deal with COVID-19 or their own vaccine passports to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 without the permission of the minister. And first of all, I know you can't speak for all 13 members of council. Uh, you can speak for yourself, but do you get a sense that had this legislation not come in, that, that Edmonton may still have a mask mandate? So I think it's very important uh, for the listeners to understand the context behind it, right? We, uh, and the mm -hmm. background behind it. Uh, we all know that province encouraged and expected municipalities to bring their own mask bylaws when province felt that uh, they should be based on local realities and local needs. So Ed Edmonton brought in its own bylaw 
at the at the insistence of the province and we recently updated that bylaw in november when we updated that we put in two triggers that will cause a review one of them was when province removes its own mask bylaw the second mm-hmm. trigger was when numbers of cases go down below 100 for 100000 population for 28 days so that trigger did not uh, that did not trigger that that criteria right so mm-hmm. so there's a process in place that council must follow in order to review the existing bylaw and that process is that we call a meeting and council debate it and then council would have to decide to do so so we were following the process that is prescribed in the municipal government act and that's yeah. why we set up this meeting on march 8th uh, to repeal or not repeal on our own without having a hammer hanging over our head from the province on uh, in bill uh, bill four right i think that's what it's called right so uh uh so you know i i the, so that is the background, right? It's not that we were not going to debate it. We were set to debate it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I I felt that, uh, and I still feel, and nervous about it, that we are still moving too fast, too quick on moving restrictions. Other provinces are looking into end of March or April for lifting mask bylaws. Having kept them for maybe another couple of weeks or a month, would have been probably more prudent approach, but here we are, right? Province was Mm -hmm. gonna repeal the mask by law anyways, because that's what the legislation stated. So we made a decision and I made my decision based on that, that what, that it would be, it would not be in existence anyways, even if you wanted to continue with it, right? So, but that's the decision made. I wanna move forward. I wanna, uh, uh, you know, look for opportunities, how, how we can continue to support uh, Edmontonians during the, these difficult times and work with province to uh, look for better ways to uh, to provide their support. And and what ways could Edmonton look to uh, legislate or put in a bylaw to to bring in other protections? I, I know that there was talk at the meeting on March 8th about the possibility of a new bylaw that reflected city-owned facilities and and public transit. I'm just curious, you know, what are your thoughts on what the city needs to do as we, you know, move to a sense of normalcy? As a lot of a lot of places, you know, BC, other provinces are are lifting restrictions, mask mandates, vaccine passports. Yeah. So there there seems to be a broad social movement to remove restrictions, yeah. but at the same time. Um, there is still a desire uh, on the part of governments to to offer some protection. So I'm just wondering what role you figure the city of Edmonton plays and what areas can council um, exert its influence over over yeah. specific areas. So there's a number of ways that we can continue to protect Edmontonians that doesn't require bylaw or bylaw changes. One is making sure that we are properly maintaining and cleaning of our facilities. We enhanced our cleaning uh, process, we clean them often, for example, rec centers. You know, there are very robust Mm -hmm. uh, procedures and protocols uh, to be followed that our administration, I'm sorry, our staff follows now to uh, properly clean and kept them uh, tidy uh, rec centers. We are, uh, have a, you know, we put more resources to uh, keep our buses clean and our LRT stations clean and having more sanitization uh, uh, materials or uh, uh, in, uh, available in those those facilities. I think we need to continue to do that, and better better filters filtering system, for example. Right, is, um, that's something we're looking at. Uh, uh, one area that I think council might have to explore uh, is on public transit. For example, the province still requires uh, uh, people to wear a mask on public transit, um, but with the repealing of our own bylaw our police officers no longer have the authority to enforce the provincial regulation, right? So we're looking at ways how we give our police officers that ability. So that might require some changes uh, or, or introduction of a very focused uh, bylaw changes to give that authority on public transit, right? So I, but there's other ways we can do it. Continue to encourage people. We are very open and have done in the past to make a community space available for uh, community clinics to encourage more vaccination 
uh, we are partnering and have partnered in the past with the cultural communities to uh, uh, increase education about the benefits of vaccination. Uh, so we will continue to do that and we continue to do that education part, continue to encourage people to uh, voluntarily wear their mask pile if they feel comfortable and, uh, you know, uh, continue to wash your hands and all the, all the precautionary things that we have taken and just reminding people. But there's uh, tangible things that city has done and will continue to do. That's it for another episode of Under the Dome. Don't forget you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome, or you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time.